So what I did there is I strummed in three different tempos to the tune of Brown Eyed Girl, at least the verse part of it. The first one was exactly about, I'd say, half tempo. The other one was about three-quarter tempo. The other one was full tempo. So I was playing at 75 beats per minute on the first one, 112 beats per minute on the second one, and 150 on the final example that you just heard. So what are the steps that we need to take to get there? I was just using three-string chords, the simple three-string G chord, the simple three-string C chord, and the simple three-string D chord. So this is just an introduction before the formal exercises in 1.2.5a. The logic basically goes like this. We are only playing three of the main five chords we've learned. We've learned C, A, G, E, and D. We're only playing G, C, and D. And we're only playing the three-string versions of those chords. So the logic basically goes like this. If we don't sound good playing three-string chords, how in the world are we going to sound good playing four, five, and six-string chords? It, it just doesn't make any sense. If we don't sound good playing at 40 beats per minute with simple three-string chords, how are we going to sound good playing at 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, 110, 120 beats per minute with four, five, and six-string chords, let alone even three-string chords at those tempos. The basic idea of all this is to have these incremental steps to take you there to where you can play just about any song, handle just about any rhythm, handle varying tempos, and handle the bigger full chords that are used in realistic musical situations. Back when I was teaching full-time, I would get this a lot, like, oh, I just want to play campfire songs. I just want to play church songs. I don't, I don't want to learn much. I just want that. That's it. As if I was going to just overwhelm them and teach them stuff that they didn't need to learn. As if somehow just learning campfire or church songs and strumming through those is easier somehow. Therefore, they don't have to learn or work as hard. That was kind of the implication. Well, if... One cannot play simple three-string chords with each note ringing out and play at varying tempos, slow, medium, and fast. They're not going to have any hope of playing or strumming through campfire church songs. It's just not going to happen. So I really go through a lot of effort in 1.2.5a to teach a variety of rhythms on just basically the C chord because the key is having, being able to handle different rhythms at different tempos, and then somehow, somehow the chords eventually wind up falling in place. The other reason for teaching varying rhythms instead of varying chords over just one rhythm is this. Eventually it comes time to, say, wanting to learn another song. Okay, that other song is going to have a completely different rhythm than the other song you're working on. So having those rhythms already in place, under your fingers, in your head, being able to play them in time, that's going to enable you to and not only that, just understanding the overall theory and concept of time and rhythm, it'll help you get just about any song. See, if you just focus on, oh, I just want to learn this one song and that's it, just so I can impress my friends, family, or girlfriend, or whatever, that's just going to have you master that one thing, and you'll just be good at that one thing. Understanding the system of rhythms and timing helps you learn more songs faster. And that's, that's the whole point of 1.2.5a is learning the varying rhythms that, sh, you know, that you're going to need, just the basic ones. And then the paid lesson, the 1.2.5b, that deals with how to switch chords in time using another song format with a track. And it goes into more detail on how to actually switch chords so you can, you can play songs faster. So 1.2.5a is the rhythms, basically you're more of your picking hand action, playing in time. And then 1.2.5b, the paid donation lesson, that deals with switching the chords in time. In other words, your fretting hand coordinating with your picking hand. So we kind of separate the hands because that's what it takes. You want to be good at one, get the other hand down, and then put them together. That's the whole idea of 1.2.5a and 1.2.5b. Hopefully you understood the points that I was making as to the importance of mastering simple chords before moving on to complex chords, slower tempos so you can move on to more up tempos, regardless if you just want to play campfire songs and church songs or if you want to be 
into more advanced musical forms such as progressive rock, jazz, metal, uh, country, whatever. Anyway, I've spoken my piece in cheers. We have that chord diagram for the C chord. And you see in the tablature how there's three notes stacked on top of one another. What we saw before is we saw string three written separately, and then right after string three to the right of it, we had uh, string two, the fret one note, and then after that we had string one open written. In other words, one note was written after the other, indicating picking one note after the other. Well, in this case, when you see notes stacked on top of each other, it means to strum them all at once. So that's what that signifies. That's the difference between what we've studied before in tab and what we have now in the tab, tablature that is. So now to indicate that that rings out for four counts in the tablature, I have that big oval around it. That circle that I have around those notes means that that note rings out for four counts after strumming it, otherwise known as a whole note. So let's look at the whole note. So that's what a whole note on the left, that's what that looks like in standard musical notation. And then also in standard musical notation, that diamond indicates a whole note strum. In other words, that means that more than one note is strummed at the same time. And that diamond by itself means that those notes that you're strumming rings out for four counts when you're in 4-4 four, four timing in the case that we're uh, doing now. So that's what a whole note, and they call that rhythmic notation. That diamond is a whole note in rhythmic notation. That's what that is formally. So let's look at ultimately what this looks like in normal circumstances. That C there means that you're going to strum a C chord, and that diamond means that that C chord is going to ring out for four counts after strumming it. That's what that means. One and two and three and four and Okay, so the way that that was notated, the diagram that is, the C chord with the diamond on the tablature staff, that is what it would look like in a realistic musical situation with music in front of you, uh, at least for what's called a chord chart or, or a rhythm section chart. And that's what we're studying. And we'll be studying these as whole notes. So I'll have the diagram followed by the rhythmic notation with the video demonstration at the same time. And remember, at any point, you can pause the video, look at it, and definitely, when you pause, always set a metronome so you have a time standard to work with. So remember, whole notes are four counts. So the difference is, instead of playing a note and letting it ring out for four counts, now that we have the diamond and the chord symbol, that means you're going to hold down that chord that's signified by the symbol, and because there's a diamond, it's going to be ringing out for four full counts in 4-4 four, four meter. One and two, and three, and four, and. We're going to take a look at the half note strum. So it's the same thing. Um, a half note gets two counts. Remember, we played those and let them ring out for two counts. Now, a half note strum, it has the diamond just like the whole note, except there's a stem attached. So that's what a half note strum looks like in rhythmic notation. One and two and three and four and So far, we're just doing all five chords just to get them using the word caged, using words association. This isn't really 
tailored towards chord switching, we're focusing more on timing with the picking hand more so than switch coordinating it with the fretting hand to switch chords. And again, remember the switching chords was covered in 1.4.2, the paid lesson, and the one after this, the 1.2.5b, in a meaningful and musical order with these chords. All right, now we're going to get into chord note strums, but before we do that, I want to get a little bit in depth on strumming technique. So the main thing is we want the bulk of our strumming to happen from the picking hand with the wrist. The wrist of the picking hand is where we want the motion from. We don't want the motion coming from the elbow, where the elbow is jerking up and down like you're, I don't know, playing tennis <laughs> or something like that, doing a backhand and forehand. We want to use the wrist. As they say, it's all on the wrist, and definitely the case with strumming, for smooth strumming. Uh, strumming from the elbow just gives a really rough and just uh, unnecessary to expend all that energy and force. You can get the same amount of force and have a much smoother sound using the wrist. So that's the main thing is using the wrist. And just get the feel of it. Don't. I'm going to go ahead and do an example. Right now, you don't have to put it in time. Just try to get used to the feeling of the movement coming from the wrist while you strum. Watch how I do it. Maybe you can play along. You could pause the video and just get the feel of it. And we're going to do this in half note strums. Here we go. One and two and three and four and And the next thing to go into depth on before we get into the quarter notes, but it's going to have a lot to do with what how we're going to play the quarter notes. Notice that on the foot taps, you know, we're going down on one. The foot is then coming up on the and, and then down on two, the next count, two, up on the and, so, so on and so forth. Okay. With our pick movement on the quarter note, when your wrist goes down on the count number, on the and, in the same direction of your foot, your wrist is going to go up at the same time in coordination with your foot as it's coming up, but it's not going to hit the strings. It's going to intentionally miss the strings. Why? Because you want that quarter note to ring out over the end. So while that quarter note's ringing out over the end, your foot's going up in conjunction with the count of and as well as your wrist going in an upward direction on the and while the quarter note rings out. The letter U that you see... That means up. That's my own, that's not formal musical notation. That's just my notation basically distinguishing between, you know, the upstroke that has that, that V that we studied. When you see that V that we had previously, that means you're actually striking the strings in an upstroke. The U that I have there means that your hand comes up but does not hit the strings and intentionally misses them. So that's the shorthand for that. And again, all of this is much easier. For me, it's easier done than said. So the explanation probably sounds a lot more complicated than all this is, but I wouldn't be doing my job as an instructor unless I explain things. So let's go ahead and do that right here. One and two and three and four and So this lesson is pretty much a marriage of both technique, timing, and tone, actually, because the technique kind of drives the tone. The smoother your wrist movement is, the less stiff and rigid your strumming is going to sound tone-wise. And here we're working on the even quarter notes, so the technique of your wrist moving down with your foot on the count number, one, two, three, or four, and then your wrist moving up in conjunction with your foot on the ands, 
there you go. You have a timing exercise, a tone exercise, and a technique exercise, as well as a chord memorization exercise and switching between the chords in time as well. So this, even just doing these quarter notes for somebody on a basic level is quite a lot. So if you wanted to, so it's not as overwhelming, um, pause the video, just get used to strumming out of, just don't play in time at first. Just get used to the feeling of the wrist movement, getting smooth tones, focus on your sound, on a nice smooth sound, focus on getting all of the notes clear of the chord. And then work on strumming one chord. So after you've gotten the tone established, you know, with the fretting hand, making sure your fingers aren't dragging across strings that are supposed to be going to open, making sure that fretting finger is holding the note so it's loud and clear, and that you're getting three notes loud and proud. And then also getting that wrist movement. Once that's established, then start putting it in time. So pick just a single chord with the metronome. Remember, all these are at 40 beats per minute. So you can set the metronome at 40, or you could set it at 80 and make each click a one and an and, kind of like how I've been doing it with the rim shot and the hi-hat, to where the rim shot's on the count numbers and the hi-hat's on the end. So you could set it at 80 and make it like a one and two and three and four and timing, to where each click is on a count number and an and. You could do that to even out the timing. Pick one chord, pick a C, pick, maybe pick a more complicated one like the D, and just do it all on one chord and then focus on the timing, even quarter notes, your hand moving up in conjunction with your foot, tapping your foot in time with the metronome, with the caveat that, okay, if you set the metronome at 80, your foot is only going to tap on the count numbers. So... It's not going to tap on the ands, but your hand is going to move down on the count numbers and up on the ands. So that might be the tricky part when you set the metronome at 80, even though you're really playing at 40. And that's the thing. Just isolate everything. Focus on your tone first, then your timing next. And then think about everything you're doing with the technique, with the wrist movement. So you're, you're getting tone, timing, and technique all with just practicing quarter notes drums. So in this example as a warm-up, I'm just going to do it on the C chord. And again, you can pause the video and do it on any chord you want, but just for the sake of demonstration, I'm just going to play the C chord, this one-measure pattern of quarter notes. I'm going to play it four times in a row, nonstop, all quarter notes. And think about all these things I just talked about, tone, timing, and technique-wise. One, and, two, and, three, and, four, and... So here we are on the eighth note strumming warm-up. So we're strumming down on the count numbers and up on the end. So observe everything. Observe how the foot moves in conjunction with the click. So if you're setting it at 40, your foot's going to go down on the click. And then in between the clicks, the foot's going to go up and then down on the next click. So, And then the count number is on each click, and then the and is when your foot comes up when you're at 40. When you're at 80 beats per minute, but kind of calling it 40, each click is on both a count number and also an and, and so the foot goes down on a click on one and then up on the next click on the and. So notice everything, how your hand moves in conjunction with the foot. The hand goes down with the foot on the count number and up with the foot at the same time in coordination on the ands. So observe how all of that works with the click. You might even want to Set the metronome and just pretend and do everything with your foot, not even without the guitar. Just pretend you're strumming with your foot and get used to the timing and everything. And then here we are with the C chord, and we're going to demonstrate it here. So remember, tone, timing, technique. Clear tones to where you're fretting everything properly so none of the fingers are dragging across the strings, muffling notes so all the notes are clear. And nice, smooth wrist movement with the picking hand, not with the elbow. Nice smooth sounds. Here we go. One and two and three and four and All right.
right, so pause this video and apply that same exact rhythm, the all eighth notes for four measures to the A chord, the G chord, the E chord, and the D chord, all for four counts per measure for four measures, all eighth notes per chord. With a metronome, tapping your foot, counting out loud if you have to. So remember the, the four things at once, tap your foot, count out loud, look at the rhythms while you're playing. And in this case, I have all the eighth notes with just the C chord. So what you'll be doing is just pretend the C chord's not there, but in play, put the other chord that you're working on in place of the C. So you'll be going one and, two and, three and, four and for four measures per chord. So go ahead and pause this video right now and do that. Before we go there, I'd like to also go into another pitfall people run into when strumming. You want to try to hit all of the strings in one swift shot with the wrist. You don't want to drag your pick across the strings. Let me go ahead and demonstrate that right now just on the C chord. I'm going to drag the pick and show you what not to do, and then I'm going to show you how it's done. See how the pick, I kind of um, dug into the strings a little bit and then raked. You don't want to rake down and rake up. That's a rake where you're kind of going one string at a time, but a little more swiftly than usual. So you don't want to rake. That's not strumming. Uh, raking is actually used in uh, what's called sweep picking. But we're not sweeping or raking. We're strumming. So strumming is hitting all those strings at once. Now, the other thing that I haven't been going over, and God, there's just so much stuff. We're only strumming strings three through one, so you're kind of having to be really careful and walk on eggshells not hitting string four, five, or six because those will make the chords uh, just sound really bad. But since we're just learning chords, we also at the same time can't start you out on those big five, six string chords either. I kind of have to make this an intro lesson and assume that not everybody knows everything. So there's only so far you can do with generalized lessons like this it's before one-on-one -on -one instruction is needed. But again, by all means, if you've been playing chords for a while and you're confident that you have all those notes clear of those big five, six-string chords, go for it. Do all these exercises in the lesson with these rhythms. But if you're just starting out playing chords, it, at the same time, you know, you're going to have a hard time doing five and six-string chords. So you have to live with these three-string chords. And so you have to work on not hitting strings four, five, and six when strumming, which is kind of a challenge. If you wanted to, and I don't recommend doing this for any extended period of time, but as a training wheel, you could maybe put um, a strip of tape over four, five, and six just so that it sounds good at first. But if you do that, then you're not going to know if you're hitting those strings or not. So it's probably best that you don't do that, but I'm just putting it out there. I'm going to now show you the rhythm where we're, we have the two eighth notes followed by the quarter notes. Remember, on the eighth notes, that V, we're picking up on the and, and then when we get to that quarter note on count two, that U, your hand is coming up on the quarter note while that quarter note rings out and sustains. You're going to miss the strings on those U's, okay, while the foot comes up. So me remember the foot coordination with the pick coordination and the counting. All of that and the tones of the chords and the proper wrist technique. We're keeping all of that stuff in mind. One and two and three and Four and Right, go ahead and pause the video, apply that same exact rhythm to the A chord for four measures, to the G chord for four measures, to the E chord for four measures, and to the D chord for four measures with the metronome. In time, tapping your foot, counting out loud, looking at the notation while you're playing, using your wrist, not your elbow, all these things to keep in mind while you're practicing. Okay, so the main thing when we have two eighth note groupings, 
followed by the quarter note or vice versa. We're going to see the vice versa the next exercise. The eighth note on the and, you're strumming up on an eighth note placed on and, and then when you have quarter notes, your hand is coming up and missing the strings with those notes ringing out over and on the quarter notes. That's the main thing to keep in mind. We're going to get some more practice on that. We're going to just reverse it. We're going to put the quarter note on beat one and the eighth notes on beat two and so on and so forth. Here we go. And remember all the things in mind, no elbow, movement from the wrist. That's the big deal in missing strings four, five, and six when strumming. And if you wanted to, I posted just the lone C chord on this new exercise. You can pause the video, set the metronome, and just practice on a C chord to get the rhythm. And then this next example is going to be the full progression just like we did. And remember, it's pretty much the same rhythm, just I reversed the eighth notes and the chord notes. That's the only difference. One and two and three and four and Routine, apply this to the A chord, the G chord, the E chord, and the D chord. Make sure all the notes are clear. Maybe pick one note at a time. Let each note ring out into each other, just like we did in 1.4.1. Make sure all your notes are nice and clear, one at a time, ringing out into each other. Then strum and make sure you hear all three notes ringing loud and proud into each other's accord, strumming in one nice swift wrist movement rather than dragging. In this next rhythm, we have a single eighth note on the count numbers, at least on count one and count three. And then on the and of one, we have the eighth note rest. So we're going to strum down on count one and cover the strings to where there's complete silence on the and. That's an eighth note rest. And remember that the eighth note rests, and all rests for that matter, were covered in the previous lesson 1.2.4. The only difference is that instead of playing single notes, we're applying this to chords. So you're having to cover more than one string with the picking hand. And the technique for executing rests with the picking hand, you, it's kind of a turn of the wrist to where you're using the blade of the hand. You can even use part of the fingers that you're not using for picking. And just watch how I do it. That's how I'm doing rests in this case. There's more than one way to skin a cat, as they say. But uh, at least for the sake of the study, I'm using more of the blade of my hand for the rest with a turn of the wrist. And remember, for rests, there has to be complete silence. You don't want to hear any leftover notes ringing out, no clicking sounds. Just try to get as much complete silence as possible on the ands, in this case where the eighth note rest is placed on the ands, on the end of one and the end of three. And then remember on the quarter note, when you strum down, on count two in this case and count four in this case, remember on the and, your wrist comes back up but misses the strings while that chord rings out over the and. That's the difference between a quarter note and an eighth note with an eighth note rest. The eighth note with an eighth note rest has a silence on and, and the quarter note, the note still rings out over and. That's the big takeaway from this study. Let's go on the C chord. One and two and three and four. And And the main thing when we are resting on the and, at least for the sake of the study with eighth notes, because we're resting on and, the next, and there's a strum afterwards that happens on a downstroke, when you mute, you want your hand muting the strings, you know, kind of with the side of the blade of your hand, to where the pick is going to be ready to pick down. So you want that pick 
since we're doing three string chords, you want that pick basically at about string three, so you can come back in on that downstroke, strumming from string three down to string one. You can see some pictures of it here and try to observe it in the video. All right, so you may hear me repeating the same instructions over and over again, and it sounds redundant. The thing is, this is the case which happens a lot in private one-on-one -on -one lessons. So I'm kind of repeating the same instructions over and over again at the expense of appearing redundant because that's what would happen in all of my private lessons for 15 years. So you may not be doing private lessons right now and kind of <laughs> getting off on the cheap with this one. So that's the deal. When you take private lessons with an instructor who really cares, they're going to pretty much tell you the same things over and over again that you're, you're kind of forgetting. So in this next lesson, we are resting on the front half of the count and coming up on the and. So in this case, we, we're resting on count one, coming up on, and, on, on the and of one, and then strumming back down on two. On the and of two, you want your hand to come up and miss the strings because that's a quarter note. It's still going to ring out over and. And then on three, you're going to cover the string right on three and then come up on the and of three. So the tendency when we're doing this is that we exaggerate a lot of movement with our elbow. And I'm telling you not to use the elbow. Use the wrist. Use the wrist. Use the wrist. Not the elbow. Not the elbow. Not the elbow when you're doing this. And we're going to get a shot at it with this one chord, the C chord. And then we're going to apply it over the progression. I'll have no more explanations. We're just going to do them back to back. One and two and three and four and All right, so here where we're resting on the count numbers, basically on a, on a downbeat, and we have an eighth note rhythm that's strummed up, we want our pick in a position to where it's going to be able to pick up. So you're going to mute with the side of your hand, but you want that pick basically at string one so you can strum upwards from string one to string three. Pretty much the opposite of what we did when we muted on the ands in the previous example the video with this rhythm and apply to A, G, E, and D, keeping in mind all of the things we've been going over. All right. I'm going to try to have some things back to back here with not much explanation. I've pretty much explained just about everything. There might be a couple more things, but I'm going to just have some rhythms here back to back. So the routine is you pick one rhythm, you do to the C chord for four measures of whatever rhythm that is. Then you do the same thing with the A chord, the G chord, the E chord, the D chord. That's the deal for this lesson. One and two and three and four and In this next example, the rhythm, at least the accents of this rhythm, are the same. But instead of an eighth note rest being on beats two and four with us coming up on the and of two and the and of four on an upstroke, we're instead going to tie to the downbeat of two and tie to the downbeat of four and then come back in 
on the back half of two and four on the ands. So it's the same rhythm, same accents. The only difference is that we're tying the note over. So instead of covering the strings and resting in complete silence, we're going to let those chords sustain into those counts. And in doing so, our hand, our picking hand, your wrist is going to move in a downward motion but miss the strings intentionally on purpose as your foot comes down. So that way you can come up on the and stroke in time while your foot comes up. Again, much easier done than said. Here we go. And that's what the D means. That D means your hand comes down and misses the string on its purpose while the previous accent rings out. Just like we had the U there where your hand comes up when that quarter note still rang out of your hand. Same thing with the D, except your hand's going down while the note's ringing out. That's what that means. Again, that's my own shorthand. That's not formal musical notation. One and two and three and four and Right, so here we are now. This is the topic of uh, what's called syncopation. Syncopation basically is putting strong accents on weak beats or off beats and or beats tying over into strong beats to where the strong beats aren't emphasized. Wikipedia probably has a better definition of it than I do, but that's kind of how I perceive it. Anyway, so in this Example, we're actually going to play the same exact rhythm. It's going to sound identical to what we just did. It's just going to be written differently. So the difference is this. In the previous example, we would come up on the and on an eighth note and let it tie for a single eighth note into the next downbeat. And remember, two eighth notes tied is a quarter note. So now we're going to be putting a quarter note on the and. So where we went up on and, let it tie over into two for an eighth note. We're, so the way it's going to be written now is we're going to come up on and on a quarter note, and that quarter note is going to be struck on the and of one but ring out into two. In other words, that second eighth note, with the logic being that two eighth notes tied as a quarter note, that was covered in the introduction to quarter notes lesson in 1.2. One and two and three and four and So more often than not, that's how that particular rhythm is notated with the quarter note placed on an and ringing out into the next downbeat. If you don't understand what this was, just keep going back until it does make sense because that's about the best way I can explain it. And go ahead and hit pause and apply that same rhythm to the remaining four chords. One and two and three and four and Pause and apply to the remaining four chords. One and two and three and four. Pause and apply to the remaining four chords. One and two 
and three and four and. Okay, some of these rhythms can be a little bit complicated to hear at times with just only the click. So I'm going to put the rhythms where we started to syncopate with the timing and um, putting coming in on the upbeats after a rest. I'm going to put those with the track, with the C chord, over the track. And remember, the next paid lesson, the 1.2.5B, I go into big detail on how to switch be chord, between the chords smoothly, as I did in 1.4.2, another paid lesson. And it's really worth the money to learn how to switch chords smoothly and effectively, because these examples in those lessons are easier than songs. And so it'll be a lot easier to play songs if you're playing musical exercises, exercises that actually sound like a song, that sound musical, that are with a track, that are at a tempo that's slow enough for you to get. And just eliminate the frustration. The, this lesson, however, has a lot of info in it that you can apply right now to, to just about any chord you want, any progression you want, that will get you closer to playing songs, which is the ultimate goal. One and two and three and four and... that wraps it up. Hopefully you have a better idea of how those rhythms sound practically. And you will have full blank backing tracks without me playing so you can practice in 1.2.5b. And that lesson can't be highly recommended enough to switch between chords more effectively to play songs. And we will see you in the next lesson. Follow that program that I have in the description of the playlist, the Jumpstart Guitar playlist, of what lessons precede what and which ones go to which, etc. Cheers.